I say it in a So it's working on the, okay. Hello? Okay, uh, sorry about that, Ryan. Um, it, take, it took a few minutes to set up this uh, Zoom recording, um, but I really want the video lecture quality uh, to be good because many of you might need to uh, really look at those videos for some uh, review. Okay, so, um, uh, so first of all, uh, uh, maybe you have noticed that we haven't released the homework five, the last homework. <laughs> so uh, uh, hang on and it's gonna finish. <laughs> so uh, the, the last homework uh, mainly focus, uh, focuses on the uh, neural networks Neural networks. So um, it asks you to uh, implement uh, stochastic learning uh, of neural nets and with backpropagation in detail. And of course, uh, uh, because uh, in the remaining, you know, remaining a few lectures to the end of this semester, we're going to introduce another type of uh, machine learning approach. It's called Bayesian learning. And uh, because of the tight uh, timeline, and also uh, many of you might have to deal with many. Uh, other final exams, uh, uh, we leave the uh, implementation of logistic regression uh, as optional, but it will give a big bonus point. So if you're interested, um, uh, please go ahead to, uh, to do that. But again, uh, uh, you can definitely start doing homework five right now. We give uh, sufficient time, it's pretty uh, plenty of time, but again, don't uh, try to do it on the last day. Um, they, you do need some time to uh, to verify the correctness your um, backpropagation algorithm and uh, to make sure that your deep learning uh, model gives you a reasonable result. Right? So um, please leverage office hours and uh, ask questions and seek for help uh, as early as possible. You do need to plan for some time uh, for the final review, not only for our course, but also for uh, uh, the other uh, classes, okay? Oh, by the way, uh, we have released the deadline for the um, final project. It is the um, it, it is it should be the end of the examining week. Uh, so you should have a our final exam will be on Wednesday, and you should have a, still have like a, a two or three days to uh, wrap up your uh, final project report. Just to give you a heads up, way. <clears throat> okay. So uh, let us uh, first uh, uh, wrap up with the uh, neural network staff uh, today. So uh, in the last lecture, we gave a detailed uh, explanation about uh, back propagation, right? So the key idea is now to naively apply the chain rule, right? So we talk about um, if we naively apply the chain rule, uh, you got to, you have to like, um, you have to like following this uh, example, right? Uh, you have to starting from each neuron and uh, backtrack to the output neuron, right? way back to the output neuron and then calculate the find all the passes connect to the current neuron and then uh, multiply the partial derivatives along the paths, right? So that's the uh, straightforward application of um, the um, uh, chain rule, uh, which is really expensive. Consider you have like a, 200 layers, right? At layer 150, and you uh, at layer 100, have to uh, go back, backtrack to the top layer, which is another 100 uh, layers, right? So it's very, uh, very expensive. So uh, the back propagation is uh, invented or proposed to avoid unnecessary computation or duplicative computation, right? So the key idea is that, okay, we're gonna start from the output, new, output layer, which is the last layer, and then we move uh, backward to the input layer, right? And throughout this procedure, at each step, we compute the partial derivative of the loss with respect to all the neurons in the current layer, 
and then uh, use the partial derivative with respect to current neurons to calculate uh, all the weights on the edges pointing to those neurons, like, like if your current neurons are in the layer two, right? Once you computed the partial derivative with respect to Z02, Z12, Z22, the computation of the partial derivative of uh, say an edge weight W222 is straightforward. You just read out partial derivative with respect to Z22 and then multiply the partial derivative uh, of Z22 with respect to W222, right? So we have explained why we can do so because um, um, the edge here, it only connects to Z22, right? So from the neural network definition or from local structure, you can see that the computation of all the other neurons uh, like Z12, Z02 has nothing to do with this weight. So only to read out the partial derivative with respect to the target neuron. And then multiply the partial target neuron over partial weight, right? That's the idea. And when you compute the partial derivative with respect neurons in the current layer, you just leverage the partial derivative uh, with respect neurons in the previous layer, in the layer one layer above. You don't need to backtrack to the top layer to the output layer uh, from scratch. You only leverage uh, the results uh, from the last step. So that's the key idea. In this way, you can avoid uh, all possible duplicated computation. So you maximize your computational efficiency. And once you go down to um, the input layer, that means your back propagation is finished. Right? So <clears throat> this is just a, um, some kind of a summary of the key steps, but I will highly recommend you to uh, follow this example we have showing manually shown in the class, right? This simple three layer neural nets actually covered all possible cases. So just to do it manually, uh, like what I wrote uh, in the blackboard, so that uh, in the whiteboard actually, um, so that you'll get to know how this procedure um, uh, is finished and, uh, and then you'll know how to implement um, this with your uh, with Python or MATLAB or R whatever. Okay. Let us, uh, this is just a brief uh, review of what we have discussed uh, in the last lecture. So now we're gonna talk about uh, uh, the last part of uh, the neural network. Right. Uh, it's about the practical um, suggestions right? when you apply uh, neural nets uh, in practice uh, what kind of uh, problems should be uh, aware and uh, what's the common strategies uh, should we use to address those issues uh, so uh, by the way so far any question everyone's comfortable all right yeah <clears throat> Okay, last uh, point, uh, last uh, uh, part for discussion, practical concerns, right? So we're gonna uh, talk about the three uh, major practical issues when you apply neural network, right? So first uh, is the problems uh, when running uh, stochastic gradient descent. So uh, like stochastic gradient descent is kind of a dominant technique to train neural nets, right? You will see them in nearly all neural network applications, uh, they're gonna use the stochastic gradient descent. But stochastic gradient descent is not perfect. It also has many other issues, which we're going to discuss later. Right? And we'll talk about the general strategy to address those uh, issues. And then we'll talk about uh, the overfitting issue of neural net. Right? So we know that your network uh, is very expressive, it's very flexible, it can approximate uh, an arbitrary function to an arbitrary uh, degree of accuracy. So this is a power, but it's kind of a um, uh, double edged sword, right? Because it's too flexible, it has large basic dimension, it has a much higher risk to overfit data, right? So, in practice, uh, if you make your neural network too complicated, meaning too large, too wide, too deep, uh, it is very easy to overfit data. So, we need to uh, adopt some like effective strategies to avoid overfitting. Otherwise, uh, it won't very well. It won't work very well in general, right? 
And thirdly, um, how do we identify some hyperparameters of our neural nets? Like how do we um, how do we determine how many layers should we use, right? How many neurons should we choose for uh, each layer? And uh, and uh, and then uh, what's the activation function, right? So this is called hyperprime tuning. Uh, this is effect, uh, this is actually a very hot topic in the machine learning research, especially deep learning research. Um, like large companies like uh, Facebook, like uh, Microsoft, and Google, they have developed their own libraries to automatically determine the hyperparameters, which determine the neural nets, which is called Auto ML platform. So if you're interested, you can take a, a search in the web. Uh, so there, there are many, many such kind of discussions and uh, documentation and code uh, in the web uh, about this. Okay, so uh, let us first talk about uh, uh, the issue of uh, using stochastic gradient descent, SGD, to train the neural nets. Right? So, uh, we know that the reason we choose SGD is because of the efficiency, right? So we don't want to uh, calculate the exact gradient. Why? It, it, it will take too long. Okay, so be more specific. Yes, exactly right. Let me repeat what you said. Right? If you have 1 billion data points, right? If you want to compute the exact gradient of the loss over this 1 billion size training data, right? You're going to go through every point, right? It goes through the whole 1 billion data points and calculate to the loss and calculate their gradient as them together, right? To, to get one exact gradient. So you, you get one exact gradient to hold one update, you have to go through 1 billion data points. That's really, really expensive, right? Given that your network itself can be very large, it may contain like millions or tens of millions of parameters, which is not uncommon. Right? So uh, in practice, people uh, nearly always uh, uh, prefer stochastic gradient descent because every time when we meet a new example, we just perform an update. So you can imagine after going through 1 billion data points, we have updated the model for 1 billion times. That is really much, much more expensive. Uh, that's much, much more, uh, that much, much more uh, uh, efficient in, in a model update, right? But there's uh, also an issue. Remember, we discussed the disadvantage of SGD, right? Although it, up, it, it updates very quickly, but uh, every update is of low quality, right? Because every time I just use one example, one random example, calculates loss and then calculates uh, loss with respect to the model parameters by using fat propagation. So this gradient is actually not exact gradient. It is the cost gradient or random estimate of this gradient. So you can imagine like a, a drunk driver, right? You drive here, drive here, drive here. Although in theory, uh, you, you're gonna still guarantee to arrive at their home, right? But every time your driving directions kind of be, can be very wrong, right? So you can imagine the learning behavior of uh, uh, SGD uh, will be oscillating, right? So according to your own experience, uh, your homework three or four, right? Implementing your SVM, right? You can see the oscillating learning curves. That's very common. Then there comes another problem, right? What if, uh, how do you determine the convergence of your SGD, right? Can we determine if your stochastic gradient descent has converged to a minimum? Or how can we exactly determine or, 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 or judge if your SGD has uh, arrived some local minimum of the Objective. How can we do that? Any thought?
So if you want to say if your you, you if your function has a has arrived uh, like minimum, and your function is dirty uh, is differentiable, how do you how do you how do you, uh, how do you uh, determine it? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So it said derivative of the function must be zero, right? That's very natural. We know that if your if your function is differentiable, if you arrive some local minimum, your derivative must be zero. But the problem is that can we use this to determine if your SGD converges or not? Yeah, so someone is uh, like uh, uh, expressing no, right? What? Why? Oh, the, let us just put aside that issue like local minimum. Uh, maybe some local minimum is bad, maybe some local minimum is good. But we just to say, okay, if can we use the derivative being zero as the checking condition? You don't have, oh, we actually have that a function, right? We just calculate the loss over all the training points. Oh, uh, you're talking about uh, looking at the step size? Well, it's like you're looking at like your gradient and like when it goes to zero, your step size is like the next least number. Hitting at zero, you're just going to like go around to zero. Uh, yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good point that you can look at the step size. Uh, but uh, that's just a theory telling you that, okay, when the step size goes to infinity, oops. When the step size goes to infinity, uh, your uh, what's wrong? Let me um, we cannot do. If your size, uh, if your step size goes to uh, infinity, uh, it goes to zero, right? Uh, meaning that after infinite number of steps, of course, you have a uh, of course, you have arrived the local minimum. But what if I just want to say, if you're if the if you are close enough to the local minimum, like how can you? Yes, exactly right. So, uh, sorry, I don't know what's happened here. Um, I need to. Uh, think. Huh. Let me. Let me first disconnect this. Can you see it? Yeah. Uh, share the screen. Uh, how do you, how about this? How can you, can you okay. Sorry, I don't know why this uh, becomes unstable. Right. Let me stop sharing and uh, also stop uh, stop the slides. Okay. 
Okay. Now let me share the desktop, right? All right, okay, it's working now. I'm sorry for this uh, um, abrupt. I don't know what happened here. Um, yeah, like back to um, back to the uh, point you just mentioned, right there, right? So, uh, I mean, in theory, we can still calculate the derivatives. You have to, but if you want to determine the convergence, uh, you have to uh, you have to calculate the exact gradient, right? You can you have to say if the exact gradient are close to zero or not. However, this is something we are trying to avoid. Why? Because computing the exact gradient is really expensive. Okay, it is because um, the exact gradient is so expensive to compute, so that we choose to use SGD, right? So that's that's actually a dilemma, right? We don't want to compute the exact gradient, but if we resolve the exact gradient, we actually do not know if we really converge to some uh, local minimum. Right? That's an issue. And then there comes the problem. How in practice we determine we should we should stop, right? And we see that many practical criteria, stopping criteria won't really care if your SGD converges or not. Okay, so uh, Another issue um, is that in practice, many large networks are trained on large amounts of data for realistic problem. That means uh, um, to train on large data, you have to run many, many epochs for adequate training. So even uh, you use SGD, that will still be quite expensive. Like if you, if you have uh, 1 million training data points, you have uh, like 10 million parameters. Well, only one epoch might not be sufficient. You have to, uh, uh, you have to run like thousands of epochs on the on the training set. That's still very expensive. Although your algorithm has already achieved the maximum efficiency, right? so <clears throat> that's why for some uh, uh, company like Google, they have developed specialized hardware to accelerate their training. For example, Google has their TPU chip. They call this uh, TPU, like tensor processing unit. So, you know, NVIDIA, they have their GPU or graphical uh, union. Uh, graphical union. Oh, come on, what's wrong? Oh. Uh, let me maybe this is just uh, the The problem is uh, the feedback. I need to I need to stop the.
подожди. Check it out. Thank you. We do it. Okay. Well, well, it's checking. So that's um, so it's Google called TPU and uh, uh, Nvidia is called TPU, right? So uh, they're trying to, you know, um, develop all kinds of hardware and even including Microsoft or, uh, or and also Apple. Uh, if you have a look at the iPhone. 11, iPhone 12, iPhone 13, they have their own chip to implement their neural networks on the chip to be enough fast, right? So, um, so now um, when we talk about the termination criteria, right? So you see that um, there are a lot of like um, criteria used in practice. The most uh, naive one will be set up um, a, um, Maximum number of uh, epochs, and so I just set up. I I I only run one thousand epochs. That's it. I don't care if uh, it really is, uh, converges uh, at some local minimum or not. Right? Or you can set some threshold on the training set arrow. Right? You can just calculate your uh, training arrow. Uh, and when you find there is no decreasing arrow, you can stop. Or you can use some um, uh, a third that addition set to check if the error uh, stopped uh, decreasing. So we're gonna uh, look at this uh, uh, later, more detail later, right? And also another thing is that because the uh, neuron, deep neural nets or neural nets, uh, they, they fulfill some kind of uh, highly nonlinear, non-convex non mapping, right? So a loss function is really non-convex, highly nonlinear. That means uh, starting from different points or initialization, uh, you actually uh, will converge at uh, different places. Okay. So it's possible that you're gonna stop at some uh, bad local minimum. Okay. So how to avoid this? Okay. So <clears throat> usually we can try several training procedures. Each procedure, we're gonna start with different random weights with a, a majority voting or um, majority of voting techniques, or you, you can use a third validation set where um, you can try random train for five times and you pick up the one who gives uh, the uh, best performance on the validation set. Okay. So it's a, so uh, you have to combine these uh, tricks right, to get some good performance. And unfortunately, many of these tricks don't, don't provide you any like right of guarantees. So don't ask me how many epochs should I use? Uh, what's the learning rate should I set? It's uh, mostly uh, is tuned by human beings. Okay. That's why there are so many uh, auto ML libraries right now developed uh, to automate this process. Okay. But they're just trying to a smart tuning. It's not like a, 
develop some theory, you derive some bond, and then you maximize something. It's not like that. Okay. Overfitting issue. Okay. How do we uh, prevent overfitting? We know that uh, the neural network itself um, is highly expressive. Um, it is. Uh, it has uh, both advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that if your concept or your target function is uh, really complicated, the neural networks is good fit. It can uh, fit that function very well. The bad thing is that it easy. It can easily overfit data. If your data is highly noisy or you don't have sufficient data, right? Then neural networks is very easily to be fooled by noises in data. Right, you get zero training error, but you get very bad test error. Right, so <clears throat> what kind of uh, uh, training practice would like to um, uh, lead to the overfitting? Right, you usually don't run too many epochs. If you run too many epochs, they may overtrain network. So this is a very uh, interesting observation in neural networks that if your neural network is large enough, you feed them to some training set. If you just keep training, keep training, keep training, uh, you see that the training error keep decreasing, keep decreasing, keep decreasing, like even until zero. Right? So the problem is that do you really want to stop when the training uh, until the training error becomes zero? So imagine that we have uh, um, discussed the phenomenon, right? So if you have uh, this uh, x x is the number of uh, epoch, right? Y x is uh, is the error, right? So if you look at the training error, you might have seen the keep decreasing, right? But how about the test error? Yeah, test error is typically like something like that. I use dash point, right? It keeps decreasing at the beginning, but at some tuning, turning point, right? It starts uh, to increase, right? So that's typical overfitting uh, behavior, right? We don't, we don't want to, you to keep training, keep training until your test error at, at this place, right? This is not something we want. I actually want to find the right turning point, right? So how can we do that? And uh, a very common used strategy is to use a, a holdout validation set. And after each update or each epoch, we're gonna look at the test accuracy. Right? So, and uh, when we find the test accuracy on a holdout data set, uh, holdout data set uh, starts uh, increasing, then you should stop. Okay? So this technique is called early stopping. So when you look at the literature, when you look at the documentation, you say, okay, I'm gonna do early stopping. They're referring to this uh, trick. And of course, uh, uh, because of the SGD nature, right? Stochastic green descent nature, the learning behavior is actually uh, oscillating, right? So sometimes uh, you may feel, okay, uh, if I just say after this epoch, my Hold out validation set accuracy starts to drop. Should I really stop or I should wait for another five epochs? Right? I don't I, I want to be more robust, right? Like uh, if you look at the how the how uh, hold out validation accuracy, right? It's likely to be some kind of perturbating, perturbating, right? Not very smooth. And uh, but there does have some uh, uh, turning point, right? So I don't want to stop here. I don't want to stop here because uh, this is just uh, some perturbation uh, due to the SGD behavior. I, I don't want to stop so early, that's, uh, that's stupid, right? So I might have uh, my early stopping strategy more robust in that I'm gonna track uh, those neural network weights after each epoch and also track the accuracy of the, on the validation set after each epoch. So only after say, uh, five, five consecutive uh, epochs showing that they are increasing. That might demonstrate that we have arrived at the turning point, right? 
And you just uh, you, you not only look at uh, the next epoch, you, you look at uh, the next epoch follow the next epoch, and the third epoch follow the next epoch. If all those epochs, the uh, holdout validation accuracy um, keep decreasing, I mean that the error keep increasing, then that might indicate uh, you have uh, started uh, overfit to the train data and the generalization performance uh, is really become bad. Okay. That's a more robust version of early stopping. But in that case, um, you need to uh, store the weights or maintain the weights uh, after each epoch, right? And finally, we'll determine, okay, we'll decide, we have decided, okay, here is the turning point. Then we should look at the particular set of uh, model weights, uh, uh, which gives the best performance on the validation set. Right? Why? Because uh, because uh, right now you have a uh, test the uh, epoch here. Right? Any question? Mm -hmm. uh, well, <laughs> there's no answer. I mean, there's no standard answer to that. It still depends on your on your strategy, like five or 10, whatever. If you want to get more robust uh, uh, or more accurate estimate of this tuning point, you, got, you, you need to track a longer trajectory, right? And if you can observe that, okay, along like 10 epochs, after every epoch, uh, the accuracy uh, is still, it keeps dropping, right? Meaning that, okay, you might have uh, arrived some uh, turning point which you start overfit data, your generation performance becomes worse and worse. Okay. But if you don't have like enough memory budget, you might only consider like uh, three epochs, right? After if uh, um, after three epochs, right? After no, uh, not after if continuously three epochs. Uh, after uh, if you continuous after three epochs, every uh, epochs result, the validation accuracy keeps dropping. That means. Uh, in my, uh, we have arrived the uh, uh, overfitting point. Any other question? Yeah, this is a very uh, commonly used strategy and it's very, uh, very effective. But here I want to mention is that the early stopping um, criterion has nothing to do with the convergence guarantee. Okay. Uh, remember, if you fully converge, if your algorithm fully converges, it might be a bad sign, meaning that you overfit to the training data, right? You have arrived the training error to be zero, right? You might overfit to the training data. It might not be good. So why? So, so that's why we often prefer the um, early stopping strategy to stop the training before the convergence. We stop at the right time. So, but someone may argue that uh, doing this early stopping, uh, you might lose some uh, uh, information in the training, right? Because uh, you got split a separate, um, you, you, you got to separate out a, a set of uh, data points to check their performance. We use the error on the validation set as a surrogate for the general, general training performance, right? Generalization performance, that can be a loose, right? And, uh, but actually, um, in many applications, people won't view this uh, as a severe issue. Why? Because, uh, like, imagine you have one million data points. Like, you just uh, use uh, one million, like, even one million or 10K points outside as a validation set, that won't be a big loss. Right? But for some cases where people will, I, oh, I want to, I want to, I want to use the value of every data point, how do we, how, how do we avoid this? We can use cross validation. Right? Remember, we can separate the training set into like k folds, like five folds, right? Every time we use four folds for training, use uh, the other fold for the testing, and then we can use k fold cross validation to determine what is the number of epochs will be the best to stop. Right? So then you know the early stopping, the time point or the number of epochs at which to stop 
becomes a hyperparameter, right? You essentially run k fold cross validation to find the best stopping point. Right? And then once you found it, like suppose through cross validation, I found the best stopping point might be 100, right? And then um, I use this 100 to retrain the whole data. I, I don't lose any data, data information. I just retrain on the whole data and then stop at uh, um, after 100 epochs. That's an idea, but uh, doing this obviously is uh, much more expensive. Why? Because we have to uh, split data for uh, k folds and you have to run this for k times and, and you have to check uh, many, many um, candidates of the stopping epochs. Right? Any questions so far? Okay. But again, in practice, uh, uh, people always uh, use uh, this the early stopping criteria. Uh, we just separate out a validation set, which is uh, relatively big. I mean, at least uh, tens of thousands or even one million, if you have sufficient data, then you just uh, uh, determine um, how long the trajectory should track to, to decide if uh, we should stop, right? If uh, after uh, several, like five numbers or 10 numbers of epochs, uh, each epoch, you're gonna decrease the validation accuracy. That means, okay, you should stop. And this is the most common use of strategy. Um, but in some, uh, uh, in some cases where your data is not that big, like you only have uh, 10,000 or uh, 100,000 uh, data points, you might consider using uh, uh, cross validation because you're not gonna lose any, uh, uh, any data during the training procedure. Okay. <clears throat> And uh, recently, um, people have uh, developed another uh, effective technique. It's called dropout. Right? It's called dropout training. Um, it was uh, proposed by Jeffrey Hinton. He's uh, the pioneer of the uh, neural network. Right? Received the, he received the training award, I think, last year or the, the year before last year. So, <clears throat> so what's dropout training? So you don't need to uh, use uh, like early stop, stopping or K-fold cross validation, all kinds of stuff. So instead, during training for each step, we use some given probability P to randomly delete or preempt some neurons initially. Say I can set P to be 0 0.2, meaning that I'm gonna go through each layer and with the chance of 0 0.2 to take out some neuron, right? So you can imagine after that, um, some part of neurons will be preempted, right? The remaining neurons will be used to compute the information from the previous layer and propagate information to the next layer. And then you arrive at output. And then when you, calculate, when you do the back propagation, you only calculate the gradient uh, with respect to the existing neurons. So we finished one update. And then suppose you have seen a next example and you need to calculate, you need to do the forward pass and back propagation, right? You do this uh, dropout procedure again. And layer by layer, you use uh, the probability P to delete some neurons in a layer and only use the remaining neurons to calculate the forward, um, to forward the information and also to back propagate the gradient. So, and uh, after the training is over, during the test, proceed, uh, test step, you're gonna use uh, all of the neurons for the prediction. 
So you can imagine when we update, every time we just update a part of the neurons in the network, right? And, uh, and this time it might be uh, neurons one, two, three, five. And the next part, it will be neurons like uh, two, four, five, right? So <clears throat> overall it has uh, a model averaging effect. You can imagine because uh, each time your updates a different set of model parameters, you actually uh, parallel in par simultaneously train a set of different models. Right? And when you make prediction, you still utilize all the neurons to make prediction. So it's kind of like model averaging, right? Because you integrate all the models together. So this is called drop off. Any question? Well, that's a good question. That's a hyperparameter. You need to select by yourself. The often choice is uh, like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. Uh, you mean, what's the role of P here? Oh, so as we just discussed, right? When you do the forward pass, you're gonna go through each layer, right? But before you calculate the information, the value of each neuron, you're gonna first use this P. You can like random guess, right? Random drawing point, right? And to, to delete, to random delete a set of neurons with probability P. Like I said, you have a P to be 0 0.1. I mean, you have a 10% chance to delete a neuron or preempt a neuron. So that means once this neuron is preempt like this one, this one, and this one. We won't calculate the value of those neurons. We only use the remaining neurons to um, calculate and then send them to the next neuron, next layer. And then we move to the next layer. We, uh, pre we, we randomly take off the neurons with the same probability P as well. So do this again and again until we reach the uh, the 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 output layer. Uh -huh. In each layer, we uh, the percent of the drone will be used. Uh, yeah. And when you do the back propagate, you only back propagate to this uh, existing neurons, remaining neurons. Including uh, this percent is random. It's random. It's random. But you can imagine this time, okay, I, I'm gonna delete this 10% of neurons, right? But next time I'm gonna delete another 10% of neurons. They might have some uh, overlapping parts. So that's why you can imagine the whole pr training procedure is trying to train different sub models, right? And uh, then finally, when you make prediction, you're gonna still leverage all of the neurons. So it's essentially to integrate the results of all the sub models. That's why people say, people claim that, okay, the dropout training has kind of a model error region effect. Does it make sense? Well, uh, we want to uh, give some exam questions about that, but just to share, share with you some uh, state of our technique. Uh -huh. Yeah, somewhat. But uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, rigorous speaking, you, you couldn't see this as a bagging because bagging, you have a separate training procedure for different models. Right? But here you actually blend all the, the training of different sub models all together. But it, has a, it does have some uh, flavor of bagging. Any other question? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, that the chance of that will be very, very small because P is really choose to be small. P cannot be P really in practice, people will never choose to be bigger than 0 0.5. The most common choice is 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. So it really happens, but if it happens, uh, you have to <laughs> take some uh, remedy, right? You can't, you cannot like one 
layer to be fully deleted, deleted right? You cannot, then you cannot, uh, you know, forward pass any messages or any information. So if that really happens, you have to write a line of code to avoid that happened. <laughs> like you resampling, right? Yeah. In, in each update, in each update, like when you see one example, you're doing this layer by layer, random, random deletion and back propagate, right? Then when you, when you go to the next example, you do this again, but now you're gonna selecting another set of neurons to delete. So it's, it's kind of a random delete and random uh, uh, update uh, very frequently. Right. Any other question? Yeah, it's a uh, recently Google tries to uh, apply dropout as uh, their patent. They don't want other companies or business to use this dropout to train their neural nets. Now, so it's, uh, it's funny because uh, everybody knows that trick right now. How can you forbid other people from you leveraging this uh, technique, right? So that brings a, a, a big debate and argument and many people claim that Google is too selfish. I just share, share, share with you some interesting story about that. But I can, I can tell you, uh, because neural networks is so uh, popular and so dominant, uh, so important in many applications, if you are able to invent some technique to effective award or feeding or to better improve performance, that will definitely come to some business issues. Like many, um, I believe, like Google or Microsoft, there are, there are tons of patents about how to secretly well train their their networks. They won't tell you. They won't. Their, they won't allow their uh, engineers to uh, to disclose their tricks. Okay. So uh, the third question and the last question. Uh, the last concern, how do we determine those uh, hyperparameters, especially how do we determine the architecture of the uh, neural network, right? So if we choose the neural network to be, to have too few hidden neurons, meaning that it is either too narrow or too shallow, then the neural network might not be flexible enough. So it might prevent the neural app system from adequately fitting the data and learning the target function, namely the concept. So of course, this is not what we want, right? If we don't want a flexible model, why not we just switch back to linear regression or linear classifiers, right? On the other hand, if you're using too many hidden neurons, like if, you're, you're, if your neural network is too wide or too deep, and then that means your neural network will be very, very flexible. It has a much higher risk to overfit. So in practice, uh, we'll always need to find the best trade-off between the two rather than pursue one extreme, right? So then how do we find the uh, best trade-off? Accomplish the trick is the cross validation. Right? So you can <clears throat> pre specify a list of uh, architecture parameters like number of layers and number of neurons per layer. And then you just run cross validation um, and to determine which particular choice uh, is uh, best in general. Right? You use that choice to train your final neural network. Um, but this one is really uh, very costly. Uh, what I want to share with you is that right now, um, these are down in industry by some auto ML package. Right? So uh, like Google and Amazon, those uh, 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 giant companies, they develop their own levers like using reinforcement learning to search for those architectures. 
or uh, using evolutionary algorithms to find the best architectures. So all kinds of uh, methods. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, the machine algorithms, they, 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 they can identify some very weird architectures. It's not, it's, it's unlike designed by human beings, but uh, such kind of architectures can give you some uh, like surprising, surprisingly well performance on particular problems. That's why uh, those auto ML libraries are so popular right now. Right? And if you're interested, you can take a look at uh, the web documentation, a lot of such kind of uh, libraries. Uh, but for the simplest uh, tuning, just using cross validation will be good. Like if you want to use that for your Kaggle computation task or your exploratory project, uh, uh, the cross validation might be uh, well enough unless you have enough time and energy and interest to look into these levers. Any questions so far? All right, so uh, a brief summary. Neural networks so far, uh, what uh, have we seen, right? So uh, we have given the definition of neural nets, right? So we give the most basic definition, multi-layer neural network. Sometimes it's referred to as a multi-layer perception or feed-forward neural network. They are referring to the same thing, right? And uh, you can view like, this is a kind of like a layer by layer transformation of the input data, right? Each layer you can view as a new representation of the data. And this network, uh, a neural network is known to be highly expressive, right? But it does not mean um, the expressivity is always a good thing, right? Because high expressivity implies high VC dimension. From the computational learning theory, we know that uh, a high VC dimension is not, is not always a good thing, right? And if you can achieve the same training accuracy, and then we always encourage a smaller VC dimension. Right? <clears throat> And then we talk about uh, the training of neural nets. We use the, we use the same uh, framework as GD, right? As we have trained for the least mean square regression and the uh, SVM. Um, but the key technique in the training is called backpropagation, right? Uh, which is essentially a very smart way of leveraging the chain rules. So <clears throat> the chain rules are, um, Naively applying the chain will lead to will lead to a lot of like duplicated computation. But by using back propagation, you can minimize uh, the recomputing stuffs and maximize the efficiency. Right? So this is a key technique, and you see that all the modern uh, neural network training procedure, uh, no one can escape from back propagation. So this is really essential technique. So uh, we didn't. Um, because neural network is a very large area and we have a, our department has a special class it's called deep learning to talk about uh, to talk, talk about it in more depth so we didn't cover uh, other aspects we only cover the essential things right so <clears throat> in a training perspective uh, even in a training perspective there are a lot of different learning algorithms uh, like different version of sgd right it's not like simply simply computing the stochastic gradient actually um, a lot of the variance on that to uh, to tweak the basic stochastic green design, like momentum-based method, right? and Ada Delta and Adam. So right, so right now, um, I believe Adam will, is the most uh, popular stochastic green design algorithm to train the neural nets. Yeah. And uh, there are also a variety of uh, different neural nets, right? very popular. And uh, you might have heard of their names, um, but they have different architectures. So <clears throat> like restricted both machines and autoencoders. Uh, so autoencoders is essentially an unsupervised uh, uh, learning neural network, right? So we can view this uh, a non-new version of PCA or SVD, some kind of things. We don't have time to cover it in our lecture, uh, but you see, you see that the only difference is the architecture. And the convolutional neural nets. So convolutional neural nets are very widely used to process images. So if you want to classify the videos, right? 
if you want to classify the images, uh, they usually apply the convolution neural nets first because they have a very effective way to integrate information from the high dimensional input. Imagine an image. Image is a, a matrix, right? It's a dense matrix. And if you vectorize this matrix, it's very high dimensional, especially for high resolution image, right? So you don't want to directly feed this high dimensional input to a um, fully connected neural network. That will make your neural network too large. So people usually first apply some convolutional layers to integrate the information from the images. This turns out to be uh, very, uh, very uh, efficient. Um, yeah, I think the tuning the word, uh, his name is uh, uh, Sun. And he's uh, in Facebook. Um, he's actually his primary contribution is uh, the development of the uh, convolutional neural nets and the recurrent neural nets. Right? Recurrent neural nets uh, are usually used to uh, predict the sequential data. Like suppose you have a sequence data, you have a uh, temperature sequences uh, from uh, uh, this season, right, starting from uh, uh, August to December, right. So of course the points, the data points, you count it for every day, is dependent, it's not an IID, it's not identically distributed uh, and independent, right? So you want to leverage the dependency between the points in the sequence. So the commonly used neural network is called recurrent neural nets. And also recurrent neural nets are widely used for uh, like natural language processing and uh, 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 machine translation. If you look at the Google's uh, uh, machine translation, right? So they really model those uh, sentences and paragraphs uh, as sequences. And those sequences are um, fitted by some uh, uh, recurrent neural nets. Of course, uh, right now, uh, there are even more popular neural networks called transformers. They call transformers, uh, but it's, they're, they're just a kind of a, a substitute for uh, this recurrent neural nets because they're more computationally efficient, efficient. And in general, the adversary neural nets. Right? So how many of you have heard of general adversary neural nets? Oh, that's good, right? So this perhaps is the hottest uh, uh, neural network developed in the last five years. No, actually 10 years, it's now five years. General so it was proposed in 2014, I guess, yeah. So um, I think one part of the reason why this uh, general adversary neural nets are so popular is because uh, it can give you many interesting and surprising applications, like stylish. So what does stylish mean? If I give you a picture, right? I, I use my camera, I use my iPhone to take a picture, right? Now I want to, um, I want to restyle my picture, but I don't want to change the content or theme of the picture. I just want to have a style, like I want the style to like the picture drawn by Picasso. I want the picture to be drawn like a, a Van, Van Gogh. Right. And the general adversary neural net, network can, can do that and doing surprisingly well. It's called stylish. <laughs> you can put any ordinary image, right? And tell them I want some, some particular type of style. It had converted to style, but doesn't change the content. If it's a, if it is about flower, it's still flower. If it is a deer, it's still deer. But this has a, a very like Picasso style. It's very interesting. I, I'll take. I would suggest you guys to uh, take a look at the uh, applications of again. It's very very interesting. And also again, uh, oh by the way, this is a abbreviated scan. Used to fake videos. <laughs> They extract some kind of real videos and then replace the faces by some some other guys, and in some cases you can even tell not tell which one which video is fake, which video is true. It's very interesting, and also computer arts. So um, anyway, uh, there are many many uh, different neural nets. They are unique mainly because of their architectures, and also uh, they have many many successful applications. Due to the time limit, we won't be able to cover so many uh, different networks, but uh, the key techniques, uh, the uh, backpropagation uh, SGD training framework are the common point all those networks share. So uh, 
hopefully our class will give you a good uh, uh, entry level introduction of those network. Okay, so I have finished uh, the new network part and uh, uh, have a great Thanksgiving break. And after that, we're gonna talk about the basic learning, the last few lectures. Thank you.